Ms. Aretha Franklin. <laughs> Listen, man. my beloved. Once again, this is Pastor well, Alexander us, McBride, pastor of the First African the Baptist Church. We are located at 601 New Street, Beaufort, South Carolina, downtown Beaufort, right behind the chocolate tree on the corner of King and New Streets. Welcome to our Sunday School lesson as presented by the Boyd's Sunday School Book for February 13th, 2022, titled Restoring Law and order. You see how those, they go together, law and order. And we, our text is coming from Ezra, the seventh chapter, verses one through 10, and then it's going to skip over to the 23rd verse through 26. And our unifying topic across the country is Ezra seeks God's law. Ezra seeks God's law. Isn't that beautiful? But before we get started, I want to remind everyone that we have started face-to-face -face worship and Sunday school services as of the 6th of February. Our Sunday school starts at 10 a.m. and our worship service starts immediately thereafter each Lord's Day. And I want to let you know that the uh, liturgy has been truncated so that we don't spend, we spend minimum time in the building but get maximum effect from the Word of God. So uh, with that said, we invite you to come out to worship with us, arms wide open, doors church wide open, please, please, Come wish. We ask that when you do, that we do be masked because of 
some of the uh, comorbidities of our congregation as well as the age. All right, so my personal office hours also, if you can't make it on Sundays, they've been changed to Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And if there's a need to sit, meditate, talk, counsel, pray, come on by. I promise I won't bother you. And also, we will be holding Bible study on Thursday evening, starting this Thursday, as a matter of fact, the 10th of February. And uh, we start at 6 to 7 prayer and 7 to 8 Bible study. Come on out and ask any question uh, uh, from or about the Bible or religion, and we'll seek out the correct answer according to Scripture. Keeping it in context, all right? May I also remind you that with the help of Second Helpings and other contributors to grocery stores throughout, thank you very much, Second Helpings, and all that contribute. We are still distributing food from our food pantry at our parsonage, which is located on the corner of Prince and New Street, right next door to the church, right across from Robert Small's house. We do this each second and fourth Sundays from 12 noon until supplies last. The only prerequisite that we have is that you have a need so that we might meet the need. Also, tangibly, that you wear your mask and follow the instructions by the distributors for their safety as well as your own. Now, I also want to let the family and friends of FAB know that we accomplished a very fine anniversary by God's grace during the month of January. Thank you all so very much for your sacrifices and your faithfulness. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for being good to us, kind to us, for giving and long suffering, Lord. And as we come before your presence, we thank you, Lord, for condescending and allowing us in your presence. Even now, Lord, as we come before you, clear our hearts, clear our minds, Give me of my sin and these, your people of their sins, Lord God, so that we may have a clear focus, a clear thought pattern that our minds and our hearts aren't darkened by sin's curse. Father, please, not only forgive me in the congregation, but Lord, please, individually and as a nation, help us, oh Lord, for help us for what we stand in need of. Now that we go into this lesson, Lord, I ask that you will give me eloquence of tongue and, and, and speech and love and kindness in my uh, uh, teaching, Lord God, and help the congregation to grasp it. Help me to grasp it. And help us not only to read and understand, but do what you would have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. So as God said, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. My love. Now, let's go over the scriptures today. Ezra 7, 1 through 10, and then we'll, as I said, we're going to skip 23 through 26. Now, here we go. Now, keep in mind, this is the time right after Esther and Ahasuerus, okay? Esther was born to Xerxes. These are the offspring, the art of Xerxes is the offspring of Xerxes. So, here we go. Now, after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Shariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitu, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Meroth, the son of Zerahiah, uh, the son of Uzai, the son of Beku, the son of Abishah, the son of Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. What a bunch of names, amen? And, and, and all of these, this is the lineage that is showing the proof of Ezra's uh, uh, elderhood or uh, priesthood, if you will. This Ezra went up. Now, notice in verse 5 and 6, there should be a colon after chief priest. That means there is a comparison. That means that things are equal on both sides of the colon. That's what we would call it in math, right? So all this I read about the lineage comes down to talking about this one man, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe. Look at that, a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests and the Levites, and the singers and the porters, and the Nethanims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, fifth month, 
which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God and for man. This is a key verse. For Ezra had prepared his heart, thank you, Jesus, to seek the law of the Lord, not only to seek it and to do it and to teach in Israel's statutes and judgments. Whatsoever is commanded, whatsoever is commanded by the God of the heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also, we certify this is this is uh, Artaxerxes. Also, we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, Nethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose old tribute or custom upon them. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, let magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. Oh, what a lesson, what a lesson, what a lesson, amen. And there is no separation of church and state in this lesson. Even though there were captors in the Babylonian uh, uh, circle and Israel was in the enslaved circle, one God we know. Now, our own sister Latoya Mack will render the Lord's Prayer in song and afterwards we'll find out what is our duty when it comes to restoring law and order. Sister Mack, take it away, Lord. Our Father. We my beloved that was so beautiful uh, uh latoya thank you so much love always wonderful in your presentation before the lord now let's get into the heart of the lesson and as i introduce this lesson i want to make an analogy if i can many of us know about what 2016 personal genetic testing became very very accessible and popular look at 
Ancestry.com and all that, all these other things. Various companies promise to provide extensive insight into a person's health and ancestry, all based on a person's genetic profile. Some tests compare a person's results with the results of other participants to reveal familiar relationships. These results sometimes provide intriguing insights and the potential for making connections with previously owned family members or discovering of famous or infamous relatives. Now, through these programs, our ability to connect with and learn from past generations has been greatly enhanced. Well, the same thing in Israel. Law enforcement has also benefited as DNA from crime scenes is compared against genetic databases. Ancestral background plays a crucial role in today's lesson. That's why you have the genealogy. And if you don't think genealogy is important, why would Christ put his genealogy in Luke and Matthew? That is to identify and legitimize the credentials of the person. In Christ's case, as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and, and great high priest, he was of the tribe uh, out of the lineage of David. And the same thing we have here in Ezra as he goes through his genealogy to prove that he's of the lineage of Levi, of Aaron. Okay, so he can, uh, he, he, his credentials are good as a priest. All right, so because of Ezra's ancestry and his, look at this, skilled knowledge of God's law, he was the right individual to lead his people back to their ancestral home. Look at what God is doing. He's choosing a person, but he's also, he has also from his childhood up, equipped that person. That's called sanctification. Set him apart to equip him for his use, God's use. All right? So let's put this lesson in context, okay? Let, let's look at what has happened in Israel. After the death of King Solomon around 930 BC, the nation of Israel experienced political and religious upheaval. There was a civil war that took place. The 12 tribes, now these are brothers and sisters. The 12 tribes of Israel were divided into 10 northern tribes called the kingdom of Israel and two southern tribes called Judah. All right, and you can see that in 1 Kings 12 and 2 Chronicles 10. Now, following this division, the king of the kingdom of Israel established two places of worship, both of them false at Bethel, and that's translated House of God, just 10 miles north of Jerusalem. And he had another place of worship at Dan, farther to the north. And the reason he did that, because he did not want to lose people going to the south, uh, to Bethlehem, to Jerusalem, to worship, and they stand there. So he built these two so-called convenient places of worship. But because they started out wrong, they are going to end wrong. If worship starts out wrong, it's going to end wrong. If doctrine starts out wrong, it's going to end wrong in your life. At each of these locations, the first thing the king did was place a golden calf. The same kind of golden calf that they destroyed out in the wilderness. A golden calf was placed at 1 Kings 12 and 2 Kings 10. This act from this king was a blatant disregard for what the Lord had prescribed regarding the place and how to worship. Look at Deuteronomy 12, 5 and 11. Idolatry such as this eventually led to the destruction and captivity of the kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians around 722 BC. And the Assyrians was a wild bunch. The southern kingdom of Judah experienced a similar fate about 100 years later. After decades and decades of immoral worship, in contradiction to the words of God's prophets, Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. That's in 2 Chronicles 36. Now, during this conquest, Solomon's temple was destroyed and the people of Judah was exiled. The land of Judah was desolate without its people, without its king, without its capital, without its temple. And within the context of this lesson, the book of Ezra described two waves of Jewish captivities, of Jewish captives returning to their homeland. Uh, it came under Ezra, came under Nehemiah. It is extremely important to understand in the book of Ezra to distinguish between these two waves. Now, the first wave took place in about 538 BC 
after Cyrus, king of Persia, and conqueror of Babylon, decreed that captives could return to Jerusalem to build a temple. Okay, These returnees first rebuilt the altar in 537 BC. Then they began on uh, rebuilding the temple. And after opposition, much opposition, and a brief delay, the temple was completed in 516 BC. Now, Today's lesson focuses on those who returned to Judah in 458 BC, 80 years after the first return. Isn't that something? Zerubbabel leading that first example. This return was led by Ezra, an expert in God's law. Look at that term, an expert in God's law, whose life, his very life, focused on proper worship of God. God, don't you know you just can't come before God any old kind of way and create a God after your own making be a golden calf or whatever and expect God to bless you in all of this idolatry? Over a hundred years had passed since the Babylonians had taken Ezra's ancestors captive. A hundred years. In the midst of their captivity, the foundation that undergirded the actions of Ezra and his people was their faith in God even in captivity, and hope to return to their homeland. Only in Jerusalem could Ezra and his people worship properly at the rebuilt temple. Now, before we get into uh, the rebuilding of the temple and all that, let's look at Ezra's qualifications. And this is, uh, this is where the physical lineage come in in verses 1 through 5. So after these things, verse 1, this phrase, after these things, refers to the events of Ezra 6 chapter and dedication of the rebuilt temple, Ezra 6, 13 through 18. Now, most scholars put about 57 years between the events of Ezra 6 and Ezra 7. Part 2 of verse 1, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. In old times, there were three Persian rulers with the name Artaxerxes, which lead us to believe that it is just a title. This one that we're talking about now is Artaxerxes I, who reigned 465 to 424 BC. Remember, Xerxes' reign ended in 464, or maybe 465, so his son took over. And since the other two reigned much later, the two other Artaxerxes, 404 to 359 BC, and the third one, 359 to 338 BC, there was no need for Ezra to distinguish among them. They're so far apart. Artaxerxes I is the same individual who would later send Nehemiah to Jerusalem. Read Nehemiah 2 and 1. Ezra, the son of Shariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah. Look at this genealogy. This genealogy traced the ancestry of Ezra all the way back to Aaron, the first high priest, Exodus 21. And it validated Ezra's role as priest. Uh, you see that in verse uh, 11, chapter 7, that's not in today's lesson, but read that entire chapter 7. It validated him. The genealogy relates Ezra to several prominent priests with the expression son of. When you see son of, that's an idiom meaning the descendant. Now, this idiom does not necessarily indicate a direct father-son relationship. It means that you're just a descendant of these people. Now, in the Old Testament, at least 11 individuals was named Shariah. I'm not going to go through all the scripture where it's found, but the individual mentioned here was likely the high priest when Nebuchadnezzar's forces captured and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Now, the Old Testament mentions more than 20 individuals with the name Azariah, including a second individual in Ezra's genealogy. Huh? This name refers to a priest and official in the service of King Solomon, that he was in King Solomon. Now, in, in 622 BC, during the reign of King Josiah, that's the young King Josiah that was raised up in godliness, the high priest Hilkiah found the book of the law and uh, that was neglected in the temple. Now, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahithu, some 14 individuals in the Old Testament shared the name Shalom. In Ezra's day, temple gatekeepers, ushers, were one of the first exiles to return to Judah. Their role was critical as they protected the entrance to the temple and the sacred items located in the temple. Now, the 
son of Amariah. Let's, let, let's look at the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Marioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Buke, a Buckeye, as you want to call it. Now, for further details about the ancestral background of the tribe of Levi, you can go to 1 Chronicles 6, 1 through 81, if you want to read all that lineage. That's a detailed lineage list, and it lists the relatives of Levi and Aaron. Now, some names from Aaron's, uh, Ezra 7 are omitted in the genealogy of 1 Chronicles. However, their lack of inclusion is not an issue as it is uncommon it was uncommon to list every member of every genealogy. They skipped here, there, here, there, here, there. They kind of truncated them a little bit. Now, the son of Abishu, the son of Phineas, the son of Eleazar, which, by the way, is translated Lazarus, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. Now, beyond his service as high priest from the tribe of Levi, very little is known by, about Abishu. Upon seeing Israel's sin and Baal Peor, Phineas is recorded to have killed an Israelite man and a Midianite woman. That's in Numbers 25 and 3. And that act of violence was seen as an act of righteousness, turning away the wrath of the Lord and establishing a covenant of peace. A lot of folks think, uh, uh, and say, I wouldn't believe in a God that does uh, punish people. Let me tell you something. We are creations. God is the creator. God is uh, as established his throne above all thrones, and we need not darken this council with our little suggestions and thoughts. God is sovereign, and he is holy, and he is mighty, and any creation that violates his sovereign act of holiness, God punishes as a righteous judge. How would you feel if you had a child or even an animal in your house that you was feeding, taking care of, and doing everything else, and they just constantly rebelled against you? That builds that tension, and after a while, something has to give. Amen? Amen. But Eleazar followed in his father's priestly duties upon Aaron's death, and that's in Numbers. Now, additionally, Eleazar assisted Joshua in distributing land to the tribes of Israel. You might consider biblical genealogies boring and useless, but they stand as historical records and are essential to show the validity of certain roles. In order to be in a certain place doing a certain work for the Lord, there has to be uh, uh, validations and there has to be uh, uh, competency. Amen? The importance of this, naming these genealogies, is seen in the identical wording in Hebrew and English of Ezra 2, 262 and Nehemiah 764. All right? So just compare that uh, as you return to them on your own time. But verse 6 said, This Ezra went up from Babylon. And we've established what Ezra this is. This Ezra, the son of all of these folks, went up from Babylon. Now, with Ezra's role validated by his genealogy, the narrative turns to Ezra's past, his specific past, leading a journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, it was about 880 miles uh, 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 from one place to the other, so it took some extensive planning. But look at what Scripture in verse 6 says about Ezra. He was a ready scribe in the law of Moses which the Lord God of Israel had given. Now, let's look at this ready scribe. I want to talk about that a little bit. That means he was competent, just like you would have a ready carpenter, a ready uh, uh, a mason, a ready farmer, somebody that have experience and know what they're doing and know what they're talking about. Unlike so many preachers today that get in the pulpit some wearing doctor bars and you know they haven't been to accredited colleges or they just bought it off the back of a comic book because as soon as they open their mouth, false, erroneous doctrine comes out and also by their speech, you know them. But Ezra was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. He knew what he, that was his job. Which the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh, that identifies God as the God of Israel. Which the 
Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, had given the law. Ezra was more than just a priest. He was described as a scribe or scholar of the law of Moses. As the legal scholars of the day, scribes were highly regarded as they studied the ancient law given to Moses. They must and they did provide accurate interpretation. And on top of that, they taught it to others. That's why you had to be a ready scribe. You have to be a ready preacher. You only get to teach this one time. And if you miss it the first time, there goes your credibility, partner. A doctor can't make a mistake if he's to operate it on the left eye. He mess around and operate on the right eye. No, that's malpractice. And the same should be applied to so-called teachers. If they teach erroneously, that is malpractice. I don't care who you sit under. I don't care how you dress, what church you go to, or who friends that you have. Right is right, and wrong is wrong, and truth is truth, and error is error. The ease at which Ezra understands the complex nuances of the law is indicated by this description already scribe. And as pastors and preachers, we should be ready preachers. We should be ready pastors. This implies skilled understanding, skilled comprehension. Ezra's focus on the law did not lie with its editorial foundations. He was not concerned with whether there were multiple authors of the law over several centuries. Instead, his Focus lay with the reality that it was the Lord God of Israel who had given the law. And that's what people do today. They try to find fault with the Bible. So it's written by man. It's the white man's book. It's all of this. It, you know, all everybody examining the box, but do not examine the content of the box. They examine the packaging instead of examining what's in the package. It is the word of God. And the box it was delivered in was put together with 66 books canonized and inspired by God, written by men. Yes, that makes the word of God in fallible and inerrant. There's no fault in it. It will not let you down and there's no error in it. All you got to do is just be a ready scribe, or a ready preacher, or a ready teacher. Know what you're talking about. And the only way to do that is to get under competent leadership and learn. So, and the king granted him, Ezra, all his requests. Now there's a Disclaimer there. He granted him all, but didn't give him everything he asked for, everything he wanted. No, no, no. So, like in scripture, when we say, knock, shall be open, seek, you find, ask, it'll be given, and God will give you everything. No, God don't give you everything that you want. God gives you, just like the king granted him his request, how? According to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. As the king granted Ezra's request and needs for the upcoming journey, it seems that Artaxerxes' attitude had changed. Elsewhere, the king ordered that work on the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem stop until he issued a new decree. That's in Ezra 4.21. And that was started in the king by a lie from the enemies of Ezra and the people of, uh, of, of, of Judah. However, the king changed his opinion and supported Ezra's journey. Artaxerxes even contributed great quantities of silver and gold for the work in Jerusalem. Ezra prepared for the moment. Luck had nothing to do with it. Luck had nothing to do with it. Proper preparation plus proper opportunity equals results. So Ezra prepared for this moment, knew the needs of the journey, requisitioned the resources, and then secured the confidence of the king. And as ungodly as, as Artaxerxes was, God put him in place so that he may teach Israel not to be idolatrous. And God ruled the king that ruled Israel. And God shaped the heart of those leaders in our country and other countries. The hand of the Lord, now when you say the hand of the Lord, don't mean like Kenneth Copeland said, God six feet two and just tall way so much. No, this is an anthropomorphism because God is a spirit.
spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But to help us understand what is happening in the heavenlies, it is compared to what we know about in the earthly. And that, my beloved, this 50 cent word, anthropomorphism. Putting God in a state of man-like ability so that we may understand what the spirit of the true God is doing in our lives. Okay? So, uh, the hand of the Lord is referred to throughout the latter half of Ezra, and it acknowledges, look at what else it does. It acknowledges the source of the blessings. We are not self-made men pulled up by our bootstraps. What we have, God gave. God is pleased to give. But don't ever think for a moment that you all let in a bag of quarters. If it wasn't for the Lord, where would I be? Amen. So God was the source of the blessings bestowed on this journey and the following rebuilding projects in Jerusalem. This journey would be successful because it was blessed by God. Now, there went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests and of the Levites and the singers, the porters, the Nephilims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. The total number of people that traveled back to Jerusalem was fewer than 2,000, but they had multiplied into the hundreds of thousands. So like our churches today, amen, so many people claim to be Christian, living in a Christian country, but yet you can see Mack trucks in the, in the emptiness of the churches. This group included the priests and the Levites, individuals necessary for proper worship in the brand new temple, singers and porters necessarily necessary for rightly ordered worship and other children of Israel. The Nethanims were individuals who had given their lives to work and minister in the temple in a non-priestly manner. They were the missionaries. They were the ushers. They were the deacons. All of these that agreed to work in the church for the common good of the church in glorifying God. That's why, even though I know that we are the church, you're the church, our body houses the Holy Spirit, but nevertheless, my beloved, remember, the things dedicated to God are just as holy as other things of God. So be careful how you treat the things that are dedicated to God to include us, his people, the physicalness of us. We are his earthly temple. The church, how you treat it. Okay? So here's the link. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. As a careful scribe, Ezra gives additional information about the chronology of the trip. And any good teacher worth their salt you just can't answer a quick answer question. When someone asks you something, you want them to in, uh, 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 enhance the entire element of what it is they need to understand. So Ezra gives this additional information about the chronology. The entire journey took place in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, about 458 BC. Looking for verse 9, said, upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. First day, first month. On the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. It took him five months to get there. The journey from Babylon began on the first day of the first month, the Jewish month of Nisan. That's late March to early April. And Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the first day of the fifth month, the Jewish month of Ab. Now, here's the thing, my beloved, when, especially when people try to muscle in on you and call it, want you to worship on Saturday and not eat pork and all this other stuff like this and whatnot, uh, 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 and looking at when the Sabbath is, look at how the Jewish calendar is put together. It is not put together like our 365 day calendar. This is equivalent to about August the 4th, uh, 5, 8, uh, 50 BC. The Jewish calendar is based on lunar or monthly cycles. Each month is approximately 29 and a half days. So the time travel was approximately 100 and 18 days, including Sabbath days for rest, because this group likely included animals and children and cargo, and those things necessary cause them to travel at a slower rate, maybe about nine miles a day, they'd be doing good. Now, according to the good hand of his God upon him, the arrival of the travelers to Jerusalem gave evidence that the providence and blessing of the good hand of his God was upon 
Ezra. And look at this word providence. Everybody wants a miracle. Everybody wants right now. But God in his providence bring everything together to do what he wants to do with you and for you so that he might be glorified. He will change the orbit of planets. He would darken the stars. He will darken the sun just to bring you to himself and his glory. Ezra had prepared. Look at what he did. He prepared where? His heart. And his heart wasn't just an emotional thing. When he talks about the heart, it talks about the deep seated emotions, but it also talks about the mind. Ezra had prepared, if we were saying in today's vernacular, his heart and mind to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. His role as a scribe and teacher is seen by the way the law of the Lord affected his life as well as the lives of others. It was not enough that he wanted to seek God's law. It wasn't enough that he wanted to teach God's law. Ultimate desire he had was to do God's law. And that's implied by a full understanding of the law's life-changing effect. Ezra's dedication to his calling change Israel for the better, encourage proper worship as the travelers return to their homeland. Ezra was obligated. He was obligated. The intervening verses consist of words of King Artaxerxes in a letter to Ezra. What verses? Verses 23 through 26. The text of this letter was written in Aramaic. We call it Chaldean. The official language of the Chaldees or the Persians. This letter granted Ezra a Authority. You see, that's something that people run off. They go and they try to preach and do everything and have no authority. But you must have an authority. You must have authority to back up your station in life. This letter granted Ezra's authority to determine the proper location to observe God's law. And this is what uh, the king said to him. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. Well, why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Isn't that something? Whether well, well, Artaxerxes regarded Israel's God as the one true God, that's undetermined. We don't know. However, at the very least, he held a high regard for the Israelites' God. The king ordered obedience to the commands of God as they related to the house of God. The expression, the God of heaven, amidst to Ezra's God is not just the God of Israel. This God is greater. He's the king of kings, Lord of lords. And Artaxerxes recognizes the scope of God's domain. He knew of God. However, it was also possible that Artaxerxes acted pragmatically, not wanting to incur divine wrath or desiring to maintain order among this kingdom. Amen? So, what shouldn't we do? Also, we, as the king talked in his regal form, also we certify you that touching any of the priests, Levites, singers, porters, nethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. Even back then, the church, for lack of better words, was tax exempt. Amen? It was customary for the Persians not to levy taxes on priests of any kind of religious order. Tens of years before Ezra, Persian King Darius the Great exempted servants of the cult of Apollo from paying taxes and tribute to the state. Artaxerxes continued that president to include all who served in the temple in Jerusalem. And you wonder where we get our customs here in America from sometimes? Well, we got our Supreme Court from the Sanhedrin. We got our laws from the makeup of our Constitution. And even now, the tax exempt is coming through the word of God. So in, even in the founding of this country, even though it was founded upon slavery and the slaughter of, uh, uh, of those around the uh, Native Americans, this place was still, still had the foundations of being ordained by God. Isn't that something? Ezra, he says, after the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, set magistrate judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach you them that know them not. Artaxerxes had developed a very high regard for Ezra and empowered Ezra to establish just 
and consistent guidance on the laws of God. Undoubtedly, Ezra's identity as an expert on God's laws allowed him to accurately know and teach others in the same regard. Now, the river talking about here is talking about the Euphrates River. That's where, where Abraham came through, amen? This highlights the geographic extent of the Persian Empire. It stretched from the Euphrates, you know about Tigris and Euphrates, right where they come together, there's Babylon or Ur. Uh, it stretched from the Euphrates to the eastern end, all the way up to the Mediterranean Sea, and from northern Syria, all the way north to, to the border of Egypt. Verse 26, last one. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. In other words, he is saying the exact same uh, uh, thing here to do the will of God and also to do, uh, keep with the law of the land if it doesn't defy God's will and God's decrees. No matter who's in charge, there's no leadership, according to Romans 13, there's no leadership that's in charge of anything that God had ordained that they be there. Now, it doesn't mean that the person's not a despot. It doesn't mean that he's not a Hitler. It doesn't mean that he's smart or none of that. It means that all authority is given by God, who is the supreme authority. Now, in this surprise move, Artaxerxes Required, he legislated people to obey the law of the king and the law of Ezra's God. Years before, Darius the Great made a similar demand requiring obedience to the God of heaven and the word of the king. You see that in Ezra 6, 9 through 12. So what are we saying? Leaders must cast vision. Leaders must invite others to see that vision. Leaders must address immediate decisions favors or requests made to them by their followers. By reading widely, listening to the advice of experts, and preparing for all possible scenarios, thoughtful and successful leaders are able to face a variety of challenges. Ezra flourished as a leader because he focused on what really mattered, the wisdom of God and the law of God. He studied God's word, he studied God's law in order that he might teach and lead Israel. And because of his determination in studying, combined with his priestly background, Ezra showed to be one of the most capable leaders for Israel's return to Jerusalem. He became an example to following generations of a God-focused leader. And the primary goals of his life were to study, to do, and to teach God's word. Let me show you, share with this again. His primary goal of his entire life was to study, to do, and to teach God's word. Can and is Ezra a model for us today? Father, God, we're thankful for the example that Ezra put on our show. Help us. May we too be good examples as we take on our daily tasks and may others see that your word guides our lives. We pray and ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, God Almighty, the Church of God said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Remember, follow Ezra's example as Ezra followed God. Until the next time, my beloved, that form there is.
Listen, man. Oh, hey, Tell your sister to don't moan. Oh, 